Okay, hey there everybody. So welcome back to the last uh, video in the series on the basics of economic regulation. And since this is will you know will be the end of this series, uh, for those of you who, who actually are my rare but regular viewers of these of these uh, videos, uh, I'll probably go back to making some some how-to videos uh, using some stats software because folks seem to like those and and they're easy and, and kind of fun to do, frankly. So uh, again, if you're sort of following these, you know, look for look for those in the coming uh, weeks. Um, but in, in in this one, we kind of want to sum up, or I, I thought it would be a good idea to sort of sum up what uh, we've done in this series. And so, in the first lecture, this one is entitled "The Rationale for Regulation." It's you know why why we need regulation, and the answer, the takeaway is is pretty straightforward. The lesson we learn, right? In a simple society, you know, we know the goods and services that we're buying and selling, and we know the people that we're buying and selling with. Maybe they're our neighbors, maybe they're even our family members. We're a small, tight-knit community. However, as technology has developed, right, as human beings, we're, we come into contact with, with larger and larger number of peoples. As I'm recording this in 2021, if I look at the products scattered around my desk, they are produced all over the world. Right, and many of them are produced in in multiple places around the world, and as a consequence, we're coming into interaction with all sorts of people that you know that we don't have the sort of shared understandings with that that we have with our family or our very close friends, and so we need to create those understandings about how we will interact, how we will exchange with each other, and one of those takes the form of regulations. So the fact that we see more economic regulations is largely a function of the fact that we're interacting with larger and larger groups of people. And, you know, that creates really good things, right? Like most of the products here on my desk I would not be able to have. It was only me and my friends making them. Um, but I can have them now. But it, it does create some some issues that we can deal with. Okay, lecture two was, was sort of a technical one about how we make regulations. Uh, takeaways there is that we have regulations at different levels, state, local, federal. In the United States, other governments have similar structures. Okay, um, those often over overlap with each other, and the process of creating uh, regulations can can be quite complicated. Uh, in the United States, regulations need to be consistent with other uh, legal uh, sort of legal history, uh, as well as um, uh, current policy practices. So there's a legal framework in which regulations are created and there's also a social framework in which uh, regulations are created. Okay, the third lecture introduced some of the basics uh, or introduction to the idea of ec economic regulation and we sort of introduced a couple assumptions here about sort of how the institutions associated with regulations work. The first, we assume that the state or the government can compel people to act, right? Uh, so it can tell us to, within degrees of other laws, right, the extent in which you know we we can do things economically speaking or not do them. So, so for example, we can uh, produce cereal for people to eat, uh, but it needs to meet certain safety requirements. Uh, we cannot sell most illegal drugs. Okay. Uh, this led us to the understanding that various groups within society are going to be motivated to influence the state because all regulations are going to reallocate uh, the distribution of goods and services in society. So in other words, if interest groups can effectively lobby the state for regulation, they can potentially benefit themselves to the cost of others. So we have to recognize that there's both an altruistic motive to regulation, to try to make things better, safer, better understanding, but also there's a potential cynical motivation to regulation, that is to try to make myself better at the cost of somebody else. And so we need to be sort of on the on the watch for that. In the fourth lecture, we introduced the idea of natural monopoly. That is that is the idea that you know sometimes there's, you just can't have competition because of the nature of the market. And in those in those situations, right, you you may wish to regulate or or you may wish to do one of these other things. You may wish the state to to actually to do the work, right? So uh, if we decide that uh, trash pickup is is really important for communities and uh, the private sector isn't going to be able to do it very well for for a variety of reasons, you know, we we may just have trash service be done by the local government. Okay, uh, we often do this with things like airports, right? So the airport may be owned and operated by the federal government. 
Okay, seaports too. There's a lot of examples where we, we utilize public enterprises. We could also employ franchise bidding, which are there are a number of methods of franchise bidding, but this is where the state is going to create an auction and essentially sell the right to operate a natural monopoly to somebody in the private sector. Okay, so for example, we might sell the right to operate an airport to a particular provider of airport services out in the private sector. And <clears throat> there are a lot of complications and details associated with how we do, would do that, but that's in that video and not here for the summary. Okay, in the fifth lecture, Optimal Pricing, we learned about the concept of sub-additivities, which you can see here, which results in sort of the, the, the wrong number of firms uh, operating in an industry. Uh, and then also we, we learned about techniques to, to regulate nonlinear prices. And we did that to account for various differences in market elasticities, demand elasticities, but also to recognize that there are problems associated with either average cost or fixed cost pricing, and that nonlinear regulated prices can allow us to account for a firm's fixed costs uh, as well as their variable costs uh, in, in a regulatory structure, which is important. In the sixth one, ascent of regulation, okay, we discussed uh, some problems associated with uh, allowable rate of return in a regulated industry. And uh, particularly the idea that if we allow uh, a regulated firm to price at its average costs, uh, that, that that would likely cause it to not not necessarily to to minimize costs and if we we regulated the price at marginal cost it wouldn't be able to cover its fixed costs so either approach is problematic which brings us to the idea that well we could regulate the rate of return uh, in in the industry and uh, the problems that we might encounter if we did that including uh, accidentally or indirectly subsidizing capital usage leading to overcapital usage within the regulated firm and then how we would mitigate that. In the second, seventh lecture we talked to some little bit about the dynamics of how uh, market changes or uh, firm cost changes can lead what were monopolies to become competitive markets and, and what were competitive markets to become monopolies. In other words, uh, technological or market changes can lead to a situation where the appropriate regulatory structure uh, also changes, right? So what was appropriate to regulate in one period isn't necessarily appropriate in another period, and, and, and the reverse is also true. In the eighth lecture, we kind of introduced the idea that, that firms compete on a lot of in a lot of different places, right? So we it's sort of the obvious competition is price. You know, like one price, price firm will undercut the price of another, and and we call that competition, uh, and that you know brings prices down to the competitive level. But but of course, if we regulate the price that firms compete at, uh, they're likely to compete in other areas, and those can include competition and geography. So that each firm tries to get the best location, right? It could be they compete on service. Each firm tries to offer the best service. Uh, to, to the customer. It could be that they compete in some kind of advertising <laughs> war or something like this. Uh, you name it, right? There's essentially uh, an infinite number of platforms on which different firms can compete in. And so if we're, um, if we're attempting to regulate certain aspects in the market, that we should recognize that, that it's highly likely that firms are going to shift the competitive struggle out into areas that are not immediately regulated. In the ninth lecture on the regulation of transportation, this was really a way to get at the idea of substitutes and complementary markets um, and the effects of regulation on those. So for example, when we regulate railroads or we regulate air transport, uh, those regula regulations are going to affect uh, most other industries because of course those other industries utilize those transportation networks. Uh, and indeed, you know, much of the original reason why we regulated railroads in the 19th century of the United States uh, was because we, w the behavior of the railroad aid industry was having, uh, well, what the society believed to be adverse effects on other markets. So regional agricultural markets, regional manufacturing markets, so on and so forth. Farmers couldn't get products to market. Manufacturers couldn't get products to market because of what was going on in the railroad industry. And so we regulated it to, to produce stable results in complementary industries in this case. But the second part of this is that we also have to recognize that if we regulate w one industry and that industry has substitutes, that we are effectively subsidizing the substitute industries. So that can create problems, but if we understand what we're doing right, then we can, we can mitigate those effects as well. 
Uh, in lecture 10, we, we moved on to sort of new level complication. Uh, we introduced the idea that, of course, a riskless world is, is impossible. We can't, we can't completely eliminate risk. And then we talked a fair bit about you know, how, how we value things that don't have values. Okay, uh, and and that's that's quite tricky. It involved, you know, what is what is the marginal cost of, of, of a lost human life, or what is the marginal value of that? Uh, how much is clean air worth? Okay, now you may be watching this and not have seen the whole series, right? And be saying, well, you can't put a value on that. Well, in fact, not only do we do we put values on them all the time, but but you do too, and. Um, it's uh, it, it's something we have to do, right? It's something we have to do as a practical matter, uh, even though it may, it may be um, uh, you know morally repugnant to to do so. And I certainly sympathize with that. I think if you have a look at at lecture ten, you know you'll you'll gain a greater appreciation of of how folks go about doing these things. Okay, in lecture eleven, we continued much of 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 what we talked about in lecture ten, except we gave more specifics. So if we were to you know, place value on human life lost uh, for for damages in say a court case. You know, what what approaches what might we use to to do that, and what what considerations might need to go into that analysis. Lecture twelve, we we again uh, uh, advance the ideas uh, developed in lecture ten, uh, but this time now to the environment. So whereas lecture eleven, we are advancing the ideas of creating non-market values for. Uh, human life, loss of human life, and damage to human life, uh, which of course, you know, th there's no market for that, obviously, that would be a terrible thing. Um, uh, similarly, there's no market for clean air or clean water or in most environmental attributes in general. And so, you know, how, how do we do that, right? What methods do we use there? This is lecture 12. Finally, then in lecture 13, we moved on to the idea of product safety, which is, uh, you know, in, in some ways related to, to both the aforementioned topics. Uh, we introduced the idea that that changes in firm behavior just don't come from regulation, right? So as regulators, it's easier for us to be biased and think sort of we're the ones, uh, you know, making businesses change their ways. And, and even in the public, a lot of times, you know, you'll ask people and say, well, you know, we've, re we've got to create a regulation to make businesses do that. And of, of course, businesses do do have to respond to regulation. Um, but businesses also respond to market choices. So if consumers want safer products and they demand safer products and they only buy safer products, then firms are going to produce safer products and no regulation is required to get them to do so. Okay. Uh, a second, so there's regulations, market choice, and there's also torts or product liability. So if producers are held liable for damages that their products might might um, cause to individuals or groups of individuals, uh, that's going to incentivize firms to change uh, how they produce. So, for example, uh, if, you know, if we make car manufacturers have some liability for lives lost in accidents, uh, then you can be sure that all things being equal, car manufacturers are going to build more safety into their cars uh, than they would do otherwise, totally apart from any regulation mandating they do so. Okay. The second thing we learned about in this is that as regulators, we need to recognize that that individuals are likely to change their behavior in response to regulation. So if we require them to wear seat belts to try to make it safer while they're driving, maybe they drive faster. Okay. If you know, if if we make them wear a helmet while they're on their bicycle, maybe they, they bicycle faster. Okay. Um, if we put a requirement for safety caps on 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 you know medicine bottles. You know, maybe people just leave the caps off because they can't figure out how to take the caps off. In other words, we should recognize that we can regulate and we can require certain types of things to occur in production or in usage of products, uh, but that at the end of the day, consumers might might have different ideas about about how that product should be used and how they're going to use that product. Thus reinforcing where we started off with in lecture one, uh, the idea that regulation really has to be a social conversation uh, and that, that any regulation that we undertake has to sort of be consistent, not just with the formal legal uh, system of the society we're working in, but, but really the, the uh, softer cultural uh, expectations and um, understandings about how things are supposed to perform uh, and operate in society. 
Okay. Um, well, that was it for the series. I hope hope you enjoyed it. And if you're just catching this last one, I hope this this causes you to go back and maybe watch one of these because, uh, of course, we've only just touched upon each one here. Each one is <laughs> obviously a big conversation. And even there, there's way more that could be said about each of these. Uh, so have a wonderful day, everybody. And uh, we'll see you again sometime. Take care. Bye.